hour. Um, I'm Jenny Riggenbach, CEO of the Community Foundation. Um, and today we are gonna discuss the impact arts and culture has on our mental health. And to help us with this discussion, we have two Community Lunch Hour second timers. Trina Bierman was actually our very first guest in September of 2021. Um, Trina is the Mental Health Outreach Coordinator at CAP Services and Chair of the Prevent Suicide Portage County, which just held its annual Walk for Hope a few weeks ago. Welcome, Trina. Mm -hmm. And Bill Sherrill is also back. Bill and his family own Team Sherrill and the company behind the store, local subways, and Sherrill Tire and Services. Bill is also one of the Community Foundation's Arts and Culture Mission Fund founders and board president of Create Portage County. Welcome, Bill. Thanks, Jenny, glad to be here. Great, and we are also joined by Maggie Marquardt. Maggie is the Executive Director of Create Portage County, and prior to joining Create just over a year ago, right, Maggie? Mm -hmm. One yep. year. Uh, Maggie held positions at the John Michael Kohler Arts Center, and most recently at UWSP's College of Fine Arts and Communication. So welcome, Maggie. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, we are um, really happy to have you here today. Thank you so much for um, uh, joining us. This is gonna be a fun discussion. Um, but before we begin, we also wanted to thank our sponsor, the UWSP Century School of Business MBA program and our corporate convening partners, Delta Dental Foundation and the Century Foundation. Your support has helped us bring the community lunch hours to life and we're very grateful to our partnerships. And we would also like to celebrate our fall grant cycle. Um, the fall, this fall, the, the Community Foundation awarded $145,000 to Portage and Washera County projects and programs aligned with their five mission areas. And those mission areas are education, wellness, helping people, the environment, and arts and culture, which we're going to talk about today. Um, we are going to be accepting grant applications for a spring cycle between January 1st and January 31st. Um, and if you are at all interested, feel free to reach out um, and we can give you a little bit more um, guidelines on that. You can also find more information on our website. And I also wanted to just thank all of you that are joining us today and um, those that weren't able to, but might see this recording, who um, have volunteered their time to review applications and make award decisions. Um, it's a really, really important role at the foundation is having your your decision making. And also thank you, Marley, for your leadership and support that you provide to our nonprofits. Um, one more great big announcement. I'm also thrilled to say that the foundation has awarded its third major project award um, and Create Portage County and Farm Shed um, have, have received that award. And it is focused on the their collaboration to um, redevelop the unique multi-generational community space at the Grove, the former home of the Sisters of St. Joseph on Maria Drive. And we're likely gonna learn a little bit more about that today, even though we're not gonna focus on that. We'll have another lunch hour focused on that at, at, at a future <laughs> date, but really we're, th we're thrilled to, um, and we're really excited to hear and learn more about that project. Um, yes, so Kaying, is there anything else we should share before we begin? Yes, uh, just that we are recording this. And so later on this week, I will be sharing the recording and a blog post uh, capturing this conversation. If you have any comments or questions during the conversation, feel free to jump in um, by unmuting yourself or typing in your thoughts in the chat. Great, and if you raise your hand, we'll be watching. So don't feel like you have to interject yourself in the mix. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. So one of the questions that we had is like, how did we decide on this topic? And um, over the past year and a half, the Portage County Life Report Executive Committee um, reviewed a lot of data and survey responses that ultimately resulted in behavioral health being named one of those three calls to action. Um, how many of you maybe, if you could just raise your hand and show us quickly, um, actually was able, were able to participate in the um, United Way's launch of the Life Report in July. Kind of get a feel for that. Um, oh, wonderful, great. Um, so some of this is gonna, is, is basically building off of that discussion. Um, and a lot of the discussions that we had as, as the executive committee um, and the other groups that the, that the, um, the Portage County United Way has pulled together over the last few years. 
Um, but also at the same time that work was going on, CAP Services completed their needs assessment and ranked experiencing an anxiety or depression as one of the seven priority issues facing people living in this, their service area. Um, you know, as part of our commitment as a foundation to the life report findings um, and also to our partners like CAP, we are really working hard to explore and learn how our community grants program might better align um, and impact these persistent issues. And so today we're gonna to focus on behavioral health. Um, as we start to explore this deeper meaning of behavioral health, we also began to wonder how investments from all of our mission areas might be impacting um, behavioral health. So for example, the American Medical Association defines behavioral health as a prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of mental health and substance use disorders, also life stressors and crisis, and stress-related physical symptoms, including anxiety and depression. Increasingly, behavioral health experts are recognizing the connection between the choices we make each day and how those connections, how our connections between each other ultimately affect our overall mental health and wellness. And our friends at Create Portage County have been teaching us about the important role arts and culture play in bridging these connections and improving our mental health and wellness. So that's what we wanna talk about today is these connections. And you know we live in such an amazing community that has so many wonderful arts and culture assets um, that give us tools as individuals to continue to bridge, to bridge, bridge connections between each other. So we're really hoping that these conversations broaden how we discuss the challenges of mental health and engage with each other to find solutions. The one thing I do wanna say before we start jumping in with our, with our guests is, you know, we're talking about connections and the role of arts and culture, but we absolutely do not wanna minimize the importance of mental health treatment by a trained professional. And this is a topic that we're working to bring another community lunch hour together on, 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 on that topic. But we encourage anyone that is, that is having struggles right now to seek out. And we're gonna start our conversation with hopefully a few data points and ways that you can reach out if you're, if you're struggling. Um, so one of those data points that we discussed at the Life Report rollout was the stark reality of self-harm among our youth. And nationally, four in 10 kids report feeling persistently sad and the number of emergency room self-harm inju inju injury visits in Portage County for people under the age of 18 increased by over 50% from 2016 to 2021. So Trina, let's start, let's start there. Um, I believe Prevent Suicide Portage County spearheaded the local data collection on that. What can you tell us about what we've learned since beginning to collect this data and what this data might look like for other populations. So um, we decided to start collecting this data because back in like 2018, 19, you know, we were hearing from so many um, teachers and people who work with youth in our community that our youth were struggling with self-harm and suicidal ideation. So we decided, you know, let's track and see how many are actually going to the ER because we're also hearing from ER staff and hospital staff, wow, we're really seeing a lot of teens starting to come in. So we started um, tracking um, a spirus in Stevens Point Clover and um, the Marshfield Clinic, but we don't have um, a lot of good data from Marshfield Clinic right now. Um, but what we have seen is a significant increase in youth coming to the emergency departments with suicidal ideation, um, with self-harm, where, you know, they're using like self-harm, like cutting or burning, those types of things for um, coping um having a suicide plan and um what's interesting is how this correlates with our youth risk um behavior survey the YRBS numbers locally so from um our stats from 20 and 21 which include all of the Portage County youth um high school age um 50 percent locally reported significant problems due to prolonged um, anxiety and sadness and 19% seriously considered planned or attempted suicide in the last 12 months. 
Now those are local numbers. Um, and 13% of them said they had a suicide plan. So that really correlates with you know, how many youth we're seeing come to the EDs in distress and crisis. Trina, does this, it, it, does income play any role or is this really across the board? Um, it's across the board. We're not seeing um, one specific um, income demographic. What we are seeing though, um, that is important to note is the LGBTQ population, that demographic um, are five times more likely to have depression, anxiety, and, and the feelings of um, suicidal ideation. Five times more likely. And that's in our community. That's not a national. That's state. nationally. That's, that's nationally. nationally. Um, and we are starting to collect some of that data and really focus um, prevention efforts on that particular demographic as well. Is, is there a sense of like what, I know we talk a lot in our community, uh, just and generally in, in society now, like the impact of COVID or, um, or you know, social media, we'll talk about social media as like a um, driver of, potential driver of some of this. Is there anything that you can tell us about what the research is saying about why we, we're seeing this kind of increase? Um, you know, people ask that question all the time and it's like, there's no magic answer, but we're seeing so many layers of, issues and stressors in youth, um, cyberbullying, sleep deprivation, um, loneliness due to less face-to-face -face interactions, um, comparing to others on social media, um, which is usually a false curated version of you know, what they're presenting, um, increase in anxiety and depressive symptoms, Gun violence is another one. And I just want to briefly mention um, the coalition sponsored a youth panel back in April. And we had a panel of SPASH students and our coalition submitted questions to ask them about their stressors and, and what they feel they need for support. And the gun violence came up as a huge indicator of stress. And I think all but one of the panel were crying when they were talking about um, being afraid to go to school due to, you know, the gun violence that they see in the media. Wow. So it's it's what they're perceiving is happening. Um, wow. Right. And even with the hoax that was called in last fall, um, they were talking specifically about that because at the time they thought that was a real um, threat and you know so talking about what how, what that did and that trauma that that caused so they have a lot of stressors do you have any um could you before we bring our other guests into the conversation what about anything uh, other populations older adults what are we seeing about from other populations as it as it relates to mental health um, well, overall, um, just in our mental health navigation program at CAP, um, it's a program that provides resources locally. Um, we've seen a 200% increase in our numbers um, from, I think it was 2020 to now. Um, so we're seeing significantly more people reaching out for those um, resources, which either means there's a lot more people struggling or we're getting the word out and people know how to contact us, but um, the numbers are very startling, um, as well as the number of older adults who are struggling, a lot of times due to loneliness and isolation. So we're doing a lot of outreach in that area as well. And how, tell us a little bit about um, CAP Services Mental Health Navigation Program and how people can reach out if they, if they are struggling. Sure. Um, so mental health navigation is a CAP program that serves all Portage County residents, no matter the age, um, youth all the way through older adults. And what we do is um, we support people by providing mental health resources. So if someone's looking for a therapist or a support group or really don't even know where to start, they can call us and we'll find um, resources for them in the community. Then we also assess what are your life stressors? Do you need rental assistance? Um, have you been a victim of domestic violence? Have you, you know, do you have food? You know, assess all of those stressors um, because we know that um, if we address those, your mental health, you know, needs will decrease. And then we also provide support and advocacy for people until they are able to com be comfortable in those connections. Very good. 
And I know we're gonna, we'll be sharing some of that ways to connect later on in the program. Um, so thanks for that, um, Trina. Um, actually, before we move on from that, you also had mentioned when we were, when we were kind of exploring this concept about multilingual and multicultural services. Can you just touch on that too, what, and what CAP is doing to make sure that everyone's served in our community? Well, and it's in, I should note that a few years ago, as early as the uh, end of 2020, it was just two of us working part-time in mental health navigation. And now we have a team of six um, that are providing services. And one of the positions that um, we created was a bilingual Hmong um, advocate, because we, we know that uh, there are needs within our um, the Hmong people in our community and language is a huge barrier. So we created a position with um, someone that is bilingual who can help interpret. Um, one of the things that she does is families in our school district, um, if kids are struggling, she will work with parents to kind of be um, an advocate um, for them with, with school. So that's another area. And so we're really looking at how can we get into the Hmong community to help um, with mental health issues. Very good, thank you. Um, you know, I think where there's this, such a strong connection is around this idea of loneliness, right? And, you know, over the past few years, I've, I've had the honor of sitting in a lot of conversations with mental health and health equity experts about the growing understanding of what it means to matter. Um, and, um, and this concept of just mattering. And if you Google it, there's, there's a wealth of really, really powerful information out there about what it means for us to um, matter to someone else and them to matter to us and that that role in mental health. And I hear Create talking about something very similar, the social cohesion. Um, both ideas stem from this idea of someone feeling valued for who you are at your core and, um, and relied on to add meaningful value back. And the research is showing that when people feel like they matter, they are more easily able to ask for help and weather social pressures like the social media you talked about, Trina, that can lead to anxiety or depression. Bill, can you talk, take us back to the early 2000s and talk about the roots of the um, Create Portage County and some of those early ideas of, of providing artists with outlets for expressing their talents and sharing them with others in the community? Most certainly. That was um, before, at that point, Arts Lands to Portage County, now Create Portage County, was formulated. There had been a study done in the community that basically said, from an arts and culture perspective, what was necessary. And the study came back and said we needed a, an umbrella organization, basically to hopefully support all the voices of the artists and the cultural inhabitants of the community under one umbrella. And that's how really Create Portage County and the roots of it. So when you bring it back to showing faces that matter and I'll you know loop back to representation matters, that was really at the nuts and bolts of why the organization organization formed. And one of the very first things that we had done was to do a campaign and that's actually just recently we had another arts walk but it was to show the faces of the artists in our community there were lots of volunteer organizations doing work from area community theater to uh, the singing choir groups the barbershoppers you know like the music groups that there's a lot of people doing art back in the day but they were not visible and that that was one of our main goals was to try and have arts become more visible. And the cornerstone of that as well at that time was the economic impact that trying to measure in ways that was being done in other communities of much larger size of saying, you know, all of this activity does have emotional social value, but it also had economic value. And that was an underpinning that we did not want to forget that none of this is art for art's sake though it's really helpful and wonderful, but there's also that, an underpinning value of mattering, self-expression, and economic impact. And I always like to say that in the, in the bottom line, it's also about entertainment. What does a community do on a Friday or Saturday night? How do I get recharged for the next week? And then if I'm not going to have 
entertainment and a lot of entertainment drives back to some level of arts and culture within the community. So I think those are really kind of the underpinnings of where we started in through our history. We've kind of just continued to grow and shift and morph into different ways, trying to respond to the needs of what's going on. It just I, that it just means so much to me, Bill, when I hear it, and I've heard you tell this story a few times and every time I just get kind of goosebumps because, you know, I was a I was a kid who went to Elman Bancroft, lived in Elman. I my brothers were, you know, football players and basketball players, but I played the French horn and mm -hmm. and in a community where there wasn't a lot of opportunity for seeing others play an instrument or an, I can still remember uh, my band teacher, Roberta Cherry, introducing me to a French horn player professor at UWSP. And it was the first time I even thought, oh, this is something people do for a living. And this is this is more than just um, a torture exercise that my parents <laughs> <laughs> of learning, learning an instrument. And, and that really did. It really helped me fully appreciate the arts. And I don't play the French horn today, but I have incredible appreciation for it, right? In terms of like what you say about how much this art really just touches so much of our lives and the economic impact, but also just um, from those early ages of what it what it means to make connections between each other. Um, before I, I wanna bring Maggie in to talk a little bit, Bill, can you do a, talk a little bit more about how efforts um, like create are providing um, avenues for artistic expression today. I know like you mentioned the arts walk, maybe talk a little bit more about that and maybe a few other things. Well, I think the one thing that I want to bring it before we go on, I want to bring it back to the community foundation as well, because that's really the long-term underpinning of where we're talking about as well is the arts and culture mission fund that was started along with the other mission funds that is that long-term support in the community. And without that, so many of these things, I referred to a lot of the volunteer organizations. And as we may all realize, volunteerism and volunteer organizations have changed over the years. When there was not as many households having dual workforces coming out of that, or even kids and young people having jobs to just get through high school and so on and so forth, there was just a lot more volunteer time and now it is those funding mechanisms from endowment funds that need to now have support to nonprofits and even at, at all levels because there's not that volunteer base that used to exist and that we need to bring some funding into people's lives as, as they produce and express themselves in whatever fashion they are. But I think also currently, you know, some of those things that have morphed onto providing those spaces is, I'll, uh, Maggie will be able to talk about the Levitt Amp series, but we just completed and actually just brought our, uh, the base and film festival will be shown in a couple weeks. And that was something that we did way back when. And um, it was what was missing from the community and film at that point, probably like 15 years ago, if not more, it was probably closer to 20. Uh, Cause I remember, um, watching film and having a film festival and getting young people involved. And I just happened to be at Lit, which is the Stevens Point Sculpture Park evening event. And one of the young men who was doing the lighting came in from Minneapolis and he was one of the first students that we had submitted as a filmmaker for his film as a young student. So 20 plus years ago, and he is stuck with it. And he's now moving, going off to do documentaries in various different parts of the country. I had learned this all from his father. So I feel like those things really do make a difference, as you said, whether it's the French horn or whether it's those things that you can have the opportunity to carry throughout your entire life. There's life drawing that goes on at the Idea Center. There's beadwork that goes on at the Idea Center. There's um, tonight is crafted, uh, if not if you haven't heard about, it, and that's culinary art. You know that was one of those things that the organization didn't start there, but it had morphed into what was missing when we looked around, and the culinary arts of the community were not being lifted up in ways that they had been. So, uh, with the help of another board member, Anello Malika, 
formulated, crafted. So community restaurants and beverage makers and distillers and, and things are coming together to elevate our culinary uh, talents and history in the community. The same with dinner in my kitchen that is from a diversity perspective. But I could go on and on, but I'll turn this over to Maggie for the, all the things that I have forgotten that are currently happening. <laughs> Well, Bill, th that's just incredible, right? It's like everything you just demonstrated is this community over the last 20 years show, you know, showing artists that they matter. And I, you know, when, when Trina talked earlier about um, the life stressors of housing and, um, you know, being able to put food on the table, you know, artists need to be able to make a living. And so I, I really appreciate you bringing that thread through on this, the economic impact is bigger than just the regional economic impact is what does it mean to an artist to be able to give their talents, but still be able to help their, you know, raise their families and enjoy their lives. Um, and that is where we are, we are needing to make grants more so that people can get paid to do the kind of um, artist expression in our community. So thank you for raising that. Um, but Maggie, Create Launch the Levitts concert series in 2017. I know, tell us about that. I know most of us know, but what were some of the original goals of that effort? Yeah, I love talking about Levitt because I think it's one of the ways that people can really sort of tangibly wrap their head around what it is that create and arts and culture um, is trying to do in, in the community. Um, and the, the Levitt AMP series really came from um, looking at another community that was um, a grant recipient from the Levitt Foundation and saying, wow, we have this beautiful public asset um, in Piffner Park. How can we bring the same series to that space and activate that space and bring the community together um, in a way that you have these shared rituals um, you come together week after week um, and you start to see the same people and new people all the time, but um, how does that not only activate that space in terms of, you know, sort of buzzwords of creative placemaking, but thinking about how do we come together um, in public spaces um, in ways that maybe we don't as much anymore. Um, we don't have the same uh, traffic patterns and, and rituals. And if you're not part of a faith community or um, if you're not getting your social network through work. Um, you, there's just fewer, I think, ways that we're interacting with each other um, accidentally, I guess I'll say, like without choosing ahead of time where we're going and who we're going with. Um, and the, really the goals from the Levitt Foundation's um, perspective, and this is a foundation based out of Los Angeles, um, and they've been activating communities across the country um, in permanent venues for a number of years. And then really wanted to open this up to smaller communities that can't sustain a year round concert facility for free concert programs. Uh, so this grant program was, was born out of that. Um, and really they helped us to put language around the work that we were doing um, and really helped us solidify this idea of talking about um, social bonding and social bridging. Um, so the, metaphors that I love to use um, that others have taught me is, you know, the social <laughs> bonding is really that super glue. So where are we shaping experiences for people who share values and interests um, to come together? And, you know, Bill alluded to some of the types of programming that has happened in the Idea Center um, a little bit more pre-pandemic than, than now, but, you know, wood carving groups coming together weekly and beaters. Um, we have monthly artist meetups. We have um, gamers who come together every week. Um, so how are we providing those spaces for the community to show up and, and shape what they want to do together for that social bonding? Um, and then social bridging um, is the WD-40. So how do we reduce the friction for people to come into contact with each other? Um, and again, for people who maybe don't share the same values, haven't had the same life experiences, um, 
don't have the same perspective about what our community is or, or, or what it means to live here. Um, and so that's really so much of what the Levitant Music Series um, was about, creating that space for social bonding and social bridging through the power of free live music and that shared experience. Um, and um, and the last point I'll make about that, our, our other main goal in launching was to show artist representation in ways that doesn't always happen in central Wisconsin. So, um, you know, we love bluegrass. We don't present a lot of blue grass um, in the Levin Amp series because we can get that um, throughout this region um, elsewhere. So what are the types of um, music genres, artists? Um, how are we showing um, people in our community, um, musical artists who maybe look like them, sound like them? Um, or how are we showing you someone that looks nothing like you and sounds no nothing like you? And, and how can we invite you into that experience? Very good. I do want to just... Um... Pause here for a second. If I see some artists on my screen, if you and any people that maybe have benefited from some of this, um, anyone though, question, comment, story that you'd like to share, feel free to raise your hand and we'll we'll bring you into the conversation. Um, but Maggie, as we were kind of waiting for some of that, I, I also noticed this summer when we were um, uh, at the Levitt and just you know enjoying the different diverse music how from week to week, depending on the artist, you saw a different mix of people coming, like bring, coming out to Levitt. Can you talk about, what can you say about the attendance numbers and, and where, where people are um, seeing themselves reflected um, in our community? Mm -hmm. um, gosh, well, I can say that um, you know we see some ebbing and flowing throughout the summer, which I think um, has a lot to do with soccer and sporting events and other things that are also really fundamental and wonderful for people to engage in, in the community. Um, you know, we typically see at least um, a thousand people each week. Um, I think early on in the summer, we had about 22 to 2,500 at one of the first concerts. Um, and I think part of that was people were just really ready for it to be summer <laughs> and before their, um, before their schedules got too busy, you know, coming together on those those evenings, um, people just really want like those precious evenings. Um, I would also say like the, some of the shifting, I think of the composition of the crowd week to week um, can be shaped by our food vendors. And some of that is rotated in with some new, um, some new vendors that are coming from Wausau and elsewhere. And, you know, the vast majority of our food vendors are BIPOC owned. Um, and there are some folks who specifically follow, <laughs> follow those food trucks to, to where they're, um, to where they're heading. Um, you know, but I think, especially if you look at last year, I know a lot of folks, um, you know, were really, um, touched by the experience of having, um, one of our first Hmong, headliners last year and then again um, this year. Um, so being able to see, I mean, the crowd engagement at those concerts is just so different than sort of what I'd say is like your typical Levitt um, where folks are kind of just hanging back um, to see the artist interaction with the crowd um, and to be able to share that with our broader community. Um, I mean, those have been some of the concerts that have had such profound energy. And I've seen other people sort of like standing off to the side and getting teary eyed, like just watching that, um, that engagement with, with the artist and, and, and the audiences. Like those are the only times that I've seen the stage rushed um, is, <laughs> um, is when we've been able to present these like really beautiful um among artists as, as headliners and then invite other people to see what that, um, you know, what that is. Wonderful. Thanks, Maggie. Yeah, no, it, I was very, um, just to hear the diverse of music and, and see, and see just joy, right? I think that's the other part that love it. Um, mm -hmm. Every week, it's just people, um, just their joy um, for coming out. Um, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Kiba, if you didn't actually raise your hand, but if you did physically raise your hand, did you have something you wanted to, to share? And introduce sure. yourself. Sure. Can, can you hear me? We can. Okay. You might hear some pattern in the background. That's uh, Kai. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
There he is. Um, I have a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, just because I mean, we were talking about connecting in art, connecting people in different meaningful ways, and how creates helping with that. And just some of my personal experiences I've had with it has been pretty um, phenomenal, in my opinion. Um, and it kind of goes back to like public art and doing stuff in public first, and giving artists opportunities to do those those types of things um, and get paid for it. Because um, yeah. there's, 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 there's not a shortage of opportunity to do stuff for free. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, even as far back as 2014, when I graduated 2015, um, there weren't a ton of like, uh, Midwest wasn't doing a lot of public art in general. It kind of started hitting us as a way of doing a lot more public art um, over the last uh, seven years or so. Um, but Create's kind of been, um, and at the time, the Arts Alliance, um, it's kind of been at the forefront of that, uh, providing opportunities. And, and uh, like I think of uh, Alex Landerman's mural in town that people love seeing downtown the two foxes and people talk about it all the time like oh they had the fox mural when did that happen and and when I talked to Alex about that we were classmates and he was just so excited to be able to do this larger than life <laughs> painting he's done a lot of artwork we've both done a lot of art been able to do a lot like a large stamp this is me this is what I think this is how I feel this is how I want to express myself and for people to enjoy it for years to come um it's a different opportunity that wasn't provided before and so that, and, 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 and that's just kind of at the beginning of it. Doing things like with Levitt, Levitt has evolved a lot over the last few years, um, even with like music collections and people that come out. There are people that just come out just because it's Thursday night and they know there's gonna be music. They don't know who's playing. They don't know what's, what food's gonna be there. It's Thursday night, we're going, to the park, we're going to the park with Levitt. Like that's what we do in the summer. And then you do have folks that come out specifically for, hey, this artist is coming. I really support them. I'm coming with all of my cousins coming with all of our family and friends because mm -hmm. they really want to show support. Um, and over the last couple of years, um, just the different food vendors being rotated in and out makes a difference, which again, it's a different type of art. But one of the best ways to connect people is food and music. Mm -hmm. And then art vendors being out as well. Um, coming out, some art vendors are out selling things, uh, um, they call it the artist market. Um, um, and some artists are out making things, some artists are just out connecting. Um, when I first started doing coming to the Levitt concerts and, and, and just coming out to show my artwork. I invited other artists to do it with me um, because I thought it was a cool opportunity. There are already people here. Clearly they love art, they're here for music. They come every week for the music. They might like some of your stuff. And then you make connections with other people, you find future clients. Um, I've been able to build my business. Um, so that's been pretty phenomenal. Um, uh, public art wise, I got my first really big art project. Um, the large, well, now my second largest mural uh, was I was connected through Create uh, with the Rosella Publishing Company and what they were looking for. And it just happened to be a really great, meaningful connection. Um, but it's because Create did the, the call for uh, public art with the Paint the Town initiative. And it was like when we first started doing a big, uh, I say we like I'm part of Create, but I'm an artist here. So. You are, you are. You are. When we, we first started are. doing the, the big uh, initiative to do public art in the area um, and we had something like 12 or 14 murals go up in a couple of years. Um, that was just basically connecting business owners with artists and, and allowing that process to happen. And then it's between the business owner and the artist for the most part that the artwork is happening and it was paid for and other initiatives happening. Uh, between that, having a public space to use, to be able to rent. Um, we mentioned the artist meetups monthly. Um, I host artist meetups through, through um, the Idea Center specifically just to connect other creative people with each other. So we can get out of our own individual solitary workspaces for a little bit and connect and have meaningful conversations and talk about it's hard sometimes being an artist. It's fantastic <laughs> all the time being an artist. You know, <laughs> we, we don't know what to do sometimes when it comes to marketing. Some people have a better idea. We can share ideas. We can share knowledge. And in those meetings, we end up meeting up with other people that are there at the Idea Center using it for podcasting or coming in and doing music things or folks that are there. They're playing video games that day. And they're like, what are you guys doing in here? This is an artist meetup. You come hang out with us. I like doing artwork too. I never knew y'all was doing this. And this is a lot of ways to connect um, people that would typically be by themselves and kind of isolated when it comes to being artists. It's a very isolated thing a lot of the time. Um, and even if it's just like once a month to come out and connect or every now and then to come out and draw, um, I've seen meaningful conversations and it seems to have significant impact on people. Um, it has had a significant impact on me for sure. Um, and 
yeah i don't know how long you want me to talk i can talk yeah. a lot about no this is great connecting um but it, it's it's very meaningful for me and, and the whole reason that I, i've really been pushing the artist meetups is because um i felt like that kind of thing was missing in the community you know i went to uw stevens point there was a community already there you go to a fine arts building any time of the day there's artists doing art there's dancers there's singers rehearsing there's people painting there's welders welding um but then when you leave school there wasn't necessarily a known community for that and we had the facilities for it you know we have the idea center and i felt like we could utilize it better and and so i started wanting to do the meet the meetups and they've been growing and people really enjoy them and they're looking forward to the next one when we meet again the third friday okay i'll, I'll see you next, next see you next month you know and um and then even outside of the meetups we see each other we're connecting more meaningful in person and uh, that's kind of the point of it to build that community and know that hey i know this artist guy he's doing something he might be a couple steps ahead of me as far as art business i can ask him questions i've met him face to face i've shaken his hand we've had great conversations or i just want to hang out I, it's it's thursday i'm looking for something to do yeah i want to go do something like making new friends kind of hard as an adult sometimes <laughs> um <laughs> You're but absolutely all- right, Kiba. Like that that's such a great the, the meetups and um stay with us for a second. I I mm-hmm. you hit on a couple things. I I think we I just show this important connection to between um mental health and arts and culture, right? And one of them is the murals, the paint the county and your mural is on the Warzella building as you said and um but Trina, you had a really fun a- example of how um how you were using uh the the murals as a as like a bingo game around mental health too can you just talk about that a little bit and what what you were hoping for and what what came from that and it wasn't my idea so i'm not going to steal it it was caitlin <laughs> nichols um one of our advocates our portage county advocate in mental health navigation um had this idea to um so may is mental health awareness month and we try to do activities um i'm in charge of making a calendar of events for may um to have things like speakers events um resource fairs things to really get mental health um education and, and information out into the community so she came up with an idea to have a bingo card with all of the murals and if you got bingo then you could come in and get we had like quick um, gas cards, is, I think were the, the prizes for that. But our idea was let's get people out into the community, looking at the art, appreciating all of these murals because a lot of times people don't know where they're all located. Um, and then it was encouraging people to get out into the community, enjoy the warm weather, um, maybe walking for exercise. And at some of the murals, we had um, different mental health resource cards and things that they could take. So it was a really um, cool activity, and we had a really good turnout for it. We had a lot of cards to fit. Very, it's not like a reason to connect, right? A reason to in, invite someone to go do something. And um, I just loved that, loved that example. Um, but Kiba, you also talked about like the artist meetup and that idea of like helping artists, you know, not feel isolated and come together and, and con- not just sharing knowledge and skills, but also sharing connections. And that is something that I have been really fascinated by about what the Idea Center has provided for lots of different groups, um, whether you're, a, you know, working from home or a remote worker and just the way of what that building community means. Um, and so Maggie and Bill, can you talk a little bit about the Idea Center um, and what it potentially is going to evolve to at the Grove? Um, yeah, how that social cohesion ma- impacts and matters? I'll touch on the beginning and Maggie can finish up where it's going. How about that? All right. <laughs> that back in the day, uh, well, probably started about eight, nine years ago because the Idea Center, we opened it seven years ago that there was a lot of people in the community talking about these co-working spaces or people to gather or where, if I want to start a business, where do I go? And that when I say conversations, that was at the city level, the county level, business owner level, there was just a lot of conversation around it. And no one was seemingly be able to make the things that were connecting and making it happen. And it was at the good graces of the county executive at that point, Patty Dreyer, that our former executive director, Greg Wright, was in a conversation with. And 
she just said, yeah, what can I do to help create? And he said, well, we need a really a space to start this thing that everyone's talking about. And she's like, well, we have this old building and you can use it until the jail is built. And that was where the, the original former Noel daycare and when AIG was in that building. So we, we went in and board members and things cleaned it up. We ripped up carpeting. We took down all the mirrors. There's still some toilets that are like for toddler sizes in the building. So it truly really was reminiscent of that. And it just became this pilot. It was an idea that the community was talking about. Things like this were happening in other parts of the country. And we did enough research locally and regionally to have conversations around, all right, what, how do you start this? And kind of the rest is history, that it was a lot of trial and error along the way. But it is, you know, I think it has been very successful. People have started their businesses out of there for a period of time, right? When we first opened, there was a business that was moving to town and rented a space until they were able to get into their new space. So it's been a lot of things to a lot of people. And I will then turn it over to Maggie to explain kind of where it's going or some, uh, you know, stories about what it is for people today. So, um, yeah, this has been, you know, the ultimate creative project, right? <laughs> There's so many things about um, how this space has evolved and expanded, you know, even within the footprint of this building. Um, and I think, you know, really, I'm not sure if it was intentional or unintentional, the way, <laughs> the way that we came into this space um, without over planning, you know, and really just sort of opened the doors um, and started inviting people in to co-create with us um, and, you know, and create as an organization, like we certainly don't um, have all the answers. We're not experts in everything, right? But we can provide um, resources and connections and the space for folks like Kiba and, and others to come in and say like, hey, I want to this is one of the first places where you could just come in and say like, oh, I'd maybe want to try this. Do you have, do you have the space that I could do it? Um, and, you know, from 3D printing to podcasting, photography, um, film screenings, um, you know, I even think back to, you know, when students at UWSP put on their own art exhibition um, and they repainted most of the space and created an entire salon um, for their own work. And so that, that shaping of the community in a way that it's led by the community and it's, um, you know, we talk a lot about, um, you know, Bill alluded to, the origins of the organization helping the community see that there are artists and there are creatives. And so a lot of the, the ethos of create is making creativity visible, you know, and connecting people to each other and, um, and, and finding sh spaces for people to collaborate. Um, and I think a lot of that visibility, we keep doing that in different ways so that, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, look around and see other entrepreneurs or, um, you know, we have, folks who come through this space um, who meet regularly because they're all part of the trans community and they have a safe space here to talk about um, issues and make plans for, for things that they wanna be able to see happen. So, you know, we talk about helping both individuals and communities to see their own potential and, and then take steps towards that, that, um, that you, you can actually do something <laughs> and we'll, we'll help you do it. Um, and so as we think about that this was a pilot space that was supposed to be very temporary and we're still here in 2023, um, mm -hmm. you know, that moving into um, this new development that is intergenerational. Um, so for folks who may not be familiar with the, um, the former convent, um, it's being redeveloped into um, apartments for 55 and up affordable housing. Um, they, they're also building a number of um, townhomes that are not age restricted, but um, are, are affordable housing as well. Um, and so this really unique opportunity to, again, go into a space um, and help the community co-create with us what, what should be there as part of this um, intergenerational residential community that's close to the high schools and it's close to the university. It's only a mile from mid-state. Um, so they're in the, in the mix too, and you know, in an elementary school. So 
we don't know what that's all going to look like, um, but it expands, creates space about two and a half times. Um, and we have been in collaborative conversations for a, a long time with Farm Shed as well, because there's a kitchen space and we've really understood together the ways that we both support creatives and entrepreneurs and that a lot of the cultural programming that we want to do together is around food um, and equity. And um, so there's all these different ways that coming into the space together will be um, really transformational. It's like the modern community center, right? Like I, I, when I hear you describing it, Maggie, I'm always struck by thinking, oh, right. I think community centers that were formed in like the early part of the 20th century that were so vibrant you know, they probably were a lot about what you're doing today. It's like, yes, that there's a, it's about making it easy for people to connect. Um, um, and sometimes that is, you know, creating a, a, a concert on a lawn where it's like accidental connecting. And sometimes it's, you know, safe spaces for different groups to be able to, like Kiva said, form an artist group and like have a reason to invite each other and, and, and come together. It's, it's, it's pretty phenomenal that we have that right here in, in Portage County. Um, and I'm excited to see where, where this goes. Um, Kaying is reminding me we've got about um, five minutes left before we wrap up. So if you have any questions or comments that you wanted to bring into the discussion, now is your time. So go ahead and raise your hand or um, put, it, put something in the chat. Um, and while we see if there is anything else, you know, um, also just wanting to kind of talk about what some of our takeaways are from this, right? Because we've, there's so many tentacles to, yeah. to, to whether you're talking about arts and culture. I mean, we started talking about food. I mean, there's culinary artists, like Bill, you talked about so many different types of artists um, and making them feel mattered in our community, but then the gifts that they give matter to all of us, right? And so I think some of those takeaways we've talked about I would say, um, you know, that going right back to Trina's initial comments, kids and adults from all economic backgrounds are struggling. Um, loneliness is real in our community. Fear is real. Anxiety is real. Um, we have tremendous mental health experts working to ensure that they have access. We heard Trina talk about the growth of their program and how if you're struggling, it's a, it's a great resource for you to connect to. Um, but there are also things we can all do to support each other's mental well-being, and a lot of that is because of arts and culture in our community. You know, if you want, we'll just go around the screen maybe. And what's um, what's something um, that comes to mind for you, Bill, that you would want to make sure, like, is a good takeaway? I think it, you know, it, it wraps back to I always think of like, what's one step that somebody could do to make a difference, both for the organization, the community, and well as your own, as well as somebody else's mental health. And that's just simply saying to somebody, a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, somebody, just invite them to an event to say, hey, do you wanna go and see this together? And just start there and just keep asking people into your space because that to me, oftentimes it's, it's always fearful to do that possibly. But it's also the possibility of what can happen and that hopefully people take that risk. Thanks, Bill. How about you, Trina? What's a good takeaway that you want to make well, sure people have? I love that Bill said that because, um, you know, that is a huge part of supporting and having good mental health is that connection. And one of the questions that um, we get asked a lot is, well, what if somebody I love is struggling? What if, what if a family member is struggling? What do we do? First, listen and make it okay to, to let them tell you they're struggling and then be in contact with them because we know isolation. We know that loneliness, those are the things that will perpetuate that negative mental health and those symptoms. So asking them, you know, checking in, texting, calling, inviting out for events. And, you know, that's something that, um, these community events are great for the work that we do at the coalition and um, mental health navigation because we table at Levitt, we table at the holiday, or we go around at the holiday parade and and um, put out resources. We do, you know, like I said, the the mural um, um, 
bingo was an idea. We go, we have a huge presence at Pride, at Stevens Point Pride. So there's um, a lot of ways that they do interconnect and um, we try to, to utilize these awesome activities and events in our community to promote good mental health. Thanks, Trina. Maggie. Oh man, I, my my mind is just spinning right now with all kinds of ways that, um, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, ways that we support entrepreneurs, which are, I think it relates a lot to um, working artists, right? You're all um, pretty much having to be um, entrepreneurs. And, and we know that the research says that um, entrepreneurs tend to struggle with mental health issues at higher rates than, you know, so I think, again, it's like thinking about how we can maybe shape some of our programming that we can be a direct feeder to, you know, CAP services, mental health navigation, and make sure that people are aware that that's um, a resource and just making sure that we're, um, yeah, that we're building those connections in a really intentional way. Um, and that there's all, you know, arts and culture are not the answer to these things, um, but we know that arts experiences can provide meaningful pathways for people to get to resources to each other, um, you know, that that it's a way for people maybe to engage in topics that would be hard for them to address. Otherwise, um, there's ways that we can think about more thoughtfully how we use arts and culture to reduce the stigma around mental health and mental wellness. So, um, I, that's not really a takeaway, but this is like how I'm thinking about, um, you know, the ways that we can shape the work that we do moving forward. I just love all the connections, right? Like that's part of our goal with these community lunch hours is where can we just spark different types of connections? So I, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, I know if you have ideas that you want to share in terms of takeaways, ways we can use mental health, um, you know, arts and culture to support mental health, don't hesitate to send us a quick note. Kaying is going to put together a nice blog and follow up from this that you'll all be receiving as well as a link to the recording. Um, I did want to just say that if you are inspired to make a gift at all, there are a few ways that you can do that. Um, to our, you can give to our Arts and Culture Mission Fund, Create Portage County. You can give directly or to their endowment at the foundation. CAP Services has an endowment here at the foundation, but I'm sure you can also give directly to CAP Services. And um, I would be remiss to, to not remind us that we are in the middle of the United Way um, campaign, which I'm guessing is part of the reason why um, Trina was able to talk about an increase in staff. Is there the, that partnership um, that CAP likely has with, um, with United Way? So you can also, I hope that inspires you to maybe look into the United Way campaign as well. Um, lots of ways that you can, you can help. Because I think the one thing we did that did come up today is that idea of, um, and make more art. Thanks, Kiba. <laughs> but that, that it is important. Money is important to all of this work and making sure that we can continue it. I hope you'll join us next time. We will be back on um, Monday, October 9th. Um, and Dr. Sam Dinga and his colleague Gigi Stahl and, an, and, an, and another uh, educator from the Stevens Point School District will be joining us to talk about um, the district's at, um, Alliance for Equity and Inclusion. This work now, I think Sam has started his third year um, leading this work um, with the school district. So we're excited to hear about what, what is happening, what are some of the trends they're seeing um, and ways that we can all support, support their efforts. So we hope you can join us. Um, you'll get a link to be able to register for that shortly. Um, and again, Monday, October 9th. So thank you all for joining us today. We hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks, Jenny.